Uh, we're going to start now in the uh, second and final session of the afternoon. We have another great panel uh, set up for you. Our moderator is Amy Bach of Measures for Justice. Uh, most of you know um, Amy's reputation and the good work that her organization has been doing. And uh, she has a, what I hope is a really stimulating panel of four folks who've been deeply involved in, um, in bail reform. We're really looking at this one to understand what the 2019 law was and the, uh, what the amendments that were introduced uh, in the summer uh, were and what the results so far of them. So I'm going to hand it over to Amy um, at this point, and we'll go um, till about 3.45 or 4 o'clock. So, uh, Amy, over to you. Thank you so much, Stephen, for having us all here. We're really excited to talk about this today. Um, so we're operating, obviously, in this very complex time where voters who are surveyed are now saying that public safety is being seen of more of a problem than even the pandemic for them personally. So in this complex context, um, there's been a national push for bail reform and New York's new bail reform law had been in effect for about three months when the state legislature amended it in early April. So the purpose of the original bill was to reduce the number of people jailed while awaiting trial um, because only because they couldn't afford bail. And it was estimated that it would have reduced the jail population by 40% by eliminating cash bail for as many as 90% of arrests in some um, in, 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 in some um, counties. So for the remaining cases, judges maintain the option of setting cash bail. But both before and after the law went into effect on January 1st, many criticized its reforms. There was limited data, which is an important point, but some still claimed that the law contributed to an increase in crime. And there were a variety of anecdotes in the press that beat the drum for immediate revisions to the new law. Uh, many prominent district attorneys and other law enforcement and public officials also called for change to the new law. So the legislature complied, putting changes into the annual state budget bill, which the governor signed a few days later. Now, the most significant change is that there are more situations where judges can impose cash, cash bail. They have more discretion in setting bail, and the updates really went into effect on July 1st. But it also, the new law also requires court administrations to collect and publicly report data regarding people charged with crimes and what happens during the pretrial phase of each case. This is extremely important to many of us who work on data. The data that the law mandates includes demographic data, criminal history information, as well as details regarding the charged crimes. Now, if done right, this information can show that the bail law is working as intended, right? But it also has the potential to reveal whether the pretrial system is treating people fairly across demographic groups. And over time, the data could also identify which conditions of pretrial release are more and less effective at encouraging people to come back to court. Now, you know, my organization is Measures for Justice. I'm the executive director. I work in Rochester, New York. And we tried for three years to get the court data. We did, and it has a lot of limitations. We wanted all the counties in New York. We only got the five for New York City. And we're still trying to figure out if what we got is a slice of really what's available or if they just didn't give us what we originally asked for for a reason. So um, I'm asking each part, each person on this panel to tell their part of the story so that you can get a full sense of how this bill happened and how it came into existence and then the limitations that came with it and how you can find data now and in the future um, as you write your stories and are sort of walking this complex line 
um, where you're talking about public safety, bail reform, and of course, there's always the pandemic, which makes everything even more complex. Um, so what I'd like to do first is just welcome our panelists. And I'm hoping that the Senator and Insha Rahman and Erica Bond and Crystal Rodriguez, could you just briefly say your name and could you say um, what you do and just a very quick, you know, and what your role generally is. And then I'm gonna start with the Senator who's gonna hopefully get this story going. Sure, thanks, Amy. Uh, I'm Senator Michael Gennaris. I'm the Deputy Majority Leader of the New York State Senate. Um, Everybody. Okay. I'm Insha Rahman. I'm the Vice President of um, Advocacy and Partnerships at the Vera Institute of Justice. And since the Senator gave a remarkably short intro, given all of the things that he's done, I'm also going to keep mine short. Um, but there's, I'm really looking forward to this panel. Good afternoon, all. My name is Erica Bond. I am the policy director for the Data Collaborative for Justice. We are a nonprofit criminal justice research organization and we're housed at John Jay College. Hi, everybody. My name is Krista Rodriguez. I'm the deputy director of jail reform at the Center for Court Innovation, and I'm really excited to be part of this panel. Okay, fantastic. All right, so let's just we're gonna go um, narratively um, at the beginning. And Senator, would you just take us through, I did a whole bunch of reading last night and read so, much, so many great things that you wrote, so many beautiful op-eds, but could you tell us the story of how um, all of the movement really began um, from your point of view so that we can you know, um, ground the story in, um, in, in um, the feeling that you got from people about what needed to change. Sure, and thank you. I figured uh, this part of the uh, discussion would get into all the stuff that might normally be in, a, in an intro, so I'll, I'll get into it now. Um, I got into this issue, I think I first introduced what we call the Bail Elimination Act about four, four or five years ago now when we were in the minority in the Senate. Um, and I had come to it just because it was an issue of great interest. I'm an attorney. I've uh, worked on innocence uh, commission uh, work. I've done always had a great, great interest in, uh, in the criminal laws and their misapplication. Um, and one of the things I did in working with the Fortune Society, which happens to be based in my district in Long Island City, was to um, volunteer to be part of their mentor program where people go on to Rikers Island, uh, talk to people who are being held there. Um, the goal is to be a mentor as they come out and help them uh, assimilate back into, uh, into society. It was very eye-opening but it did inform my work. It wasn't just something I came at academically. I actually um, rolled up my sleeves and really wanted to um, get into it. Um, and so it was uh, very eye-opening, um, aside from the, all the stories you read in the papers and know about, to see it with your own eyes and to talk to people who maybe aren't in the headlines, but are also experiencing awful things, really gives a sense of the need to make change. So the bill went in. Uh, it's one of those issues that, um, really saw the light of day because the majority in the Senate flipped. Um, like so many other things we got done in 2019 and 2020, this first term of the majority, um, this was certainly uh, on that list. Um, and we came at it in 2019. It was uh, a priority for many of us. Uh, we were talking with um, a number of the advocacy groups along the way, some of whom are on these panels and, and represented here today. Uh, we also did speak to law enforcement. I want to dispel that myth up front because one of the uh, critiques from that side of the world is that nobody uh, spoke to them. We just did this uh, uh, at the 11th hour. As I mentioned, the bill was in for years um, and there were months of discussions and negotiations, including with the NYPD, the New York City PBA, Suffolk sheriffs, DAs from all over the state, uh, the state troopers. Like There was ample opportunity for input from uh, that side of the world, uh, they may not have liked the outcome, but to say that they were not given the opportunity to opine is, is just not uh, factually correct. Um, and as we were uh, engaged in the negotiations in 2019, it really boiled down to um, two options that were available. One was um, the complete elimination of bail in all circumstances uh, and replacing that with a dangerousness standard, which has many perils and many of us did not want. 
um, or uh, what we ended up with, which is a, a hybrid uh, system of sorts, which is there was still a, a basket or what we call it the available bucket of uh, charges that would still be eligible for bail. And then the vast majority uh, of the uh, rating charges would not be. Um, that's where we ended up in 2019. We, we uh, passed the bill, it got enacted uh, as part of the budget that year. Um, and it didn't take long for the alarmists to start screaming even before it went into effect. Um, and certainly on January 1, as soon as it did, um, the lies started flowing um, and they were plentiful. Um, they were cases that people were out having nothing to do with the bail reforms. Uh, there were cases where judges had discretion to impose bail and they chose not to, which again has nothing to do with the law uh, that we passed. Um, and it got to the point where um, the New York Post of all uh, outlets debunked the myth um, and they continue to write about it today. They looked at the available data, they looked at the increase um, in, uh, uh, in reported crimes and they determined, I think, that it was one individual out of hundreds um, that, were, um, that were charged with shooting crimes, I think is the one they looked at specifically, was um, supposedly out because of uh, of uh, not having bail imposed because the law required uh, that there be no bail. Um, they dug further, so it's actually, it was a good job by them and it's worth taking a look at, but they looked at how many people who were let out without bail were even remotely connected to um, uh, uh, some of these violent uh, charges. Um, and overwhelmingly they found to the, it was less than 1% of people let out of Rikers were even affiliated in any way with, uh, with some of these uh, allegations. And more than half of that, less than 1%, were there either as witnesses or victims. Um, and a huge number of the remainder were, um, were uh, identified as suspects, which doesn't even mean they were uh, guilty or not. Um, Amy, I don't have to tell you uh, the recent news in Rochester. Um, you know, when you're relying on law enforcement to give you data and give you information, that can be manipulated. And uh, it was this exact issue, I think, that's been revealed just yesterday in Rochester, where the police uh, specified uh, the, uh, Mr. Prude that uh, as a suspect, they changed the report to designate him as a suspect instead of as an individual uh, because they were trying to manipulate the storyline around what happened there. So obviously, if you're seeing that uh, much data confirming that bail reform is working and not leading to uh, additional uh, problems in the streets, and that information itself is coming from law enforcement, that tells you a lot about the truth uh, and where the truth lies. Um, one interesting point, uh, we've had obviously the, the rash of uh, police abuse cases all around the country, and I forget which incident it was specifically, but I was uh, on Twitter as I want to be uh, these days, uh, and I saw um, a PBA somewhere say, well, this uh, officer was accused, we don't know what happened yet, let's, uh, you know, uh, let's uh, let him avail himself of his, of his constitutional rights, etc. And I said, well, isn't that interesting? When, when a potential perpetrator is a member of law enforcement, the PBAs are the first ones to jump up and say, wait, innocent, uh, must prove guilty, let's let the process play out and let someone um, have their right support for them. But when it's not, uh, and usually when it's a, a younger person of color, uh, they want to lock them up and, and somehow bail reform is, is the big problem. Um, let's all remember where this came from. These are people who have not yet been convicted of a crime. They have been charged with a crime and they have not had their day in court. They have not been convicted. And the only reason they would be held, unless they remanded, which are very few cases, would be because they don't have the money to pay the bail. Okay, the injustice of allowing a Harvey Weinstein to drop as much as the court requires and be hanging out at uh, comedy clubs and, uh, and, uh, and restaurants, this was pre-pandemic, um, while a similarly situated um, a person of color typically who does not have the means would be uh, locked in Rikers for months, if not years. Uh, that is the problem we have taken huge steps to solve um, starting in 2019. We did, uh, as a result of all of uh, the, um, yes, the pressure, but also some of our members, uh, we're just gathering data and um, evaluating the process, granted in a very short window of time since it only went to effect in January. Um, and we do engage in a democratic process. Uh, so uh, we did have a, a point where uh, the legislature, both houses, decided to make some changes. Um, they were, uh, I would say, fairly modest. The governor in particular wanted to reinsert dangerousness into the conversation, so we managed to avoid that. 
um, and we expanded that bucket uh, that I referenced uh, earlier. Uh, most notably, I think, I mean, a lot of the, the charges on the increased bucket were pretty uh, uh, obviously needed to be in there. I don't think even uh, many of the advocacy community would object, but there were some instances, and I think the one that may have a big impact is um, on repeat offender, or re allegedly repeat offenders while out on uh, without bail in the first instance. So there were a number of highly publicized cases. I think it was like the bank robber or, you know, uh, someone who would break into cars repeatedly who would just be getting processed on an arrest and then be back out and allegedly doing the same thing again. Um, and so we did uh, change the law to say that if someone has been released without bail um, and is alleged to commit another crime that um, has a victim, a victim, you know, victim less crimes are not included, but it would be a victim against a person, um, an identifiable person, then that second allegation would be bailable. Um, we did also add, managed to add in, I think Amy, you mentioned the new reporting requirements, which we've been trying to get uh, for a good long time. So some good came out of that. Um, and uh, we're now in the period where a lot of things have been conflated. Bail reform is a phrase that people understand or misunderstand, but they know it's something that happened. Um, but there is uh, an increase in reported crimes now, and everyone's trying to figure out why that is. I should note it's happening all over the country, and so places that did not engage in the bail reform process are similarly experiencing this. The pandemic and the economic downturn has obviously caused havoc in a lot of ways. Um, we also had um, uh, numerous people who were incarcerated uh, released because of concerns about COVID-19 uh, in the jail system. Uh, the NYPD in particular has made some policy changes uh, that uh, arguably have had an impact uh, in this uh, arena. Uh, and so all of these things bundled together, um, people like to just say they're all at fault and, and people are using frankly bail reform as a political tool right now. We're in election season after all, um, as the boogeyman that has caused this, where the, when the data as documented by the New York Post makes clear that that is not at all the case. Um, and so what we're now hoping is that we, we do have these uh, uh, semi-annual reports um, that will be coming and the hope is that we will be able to make decisions going forward on genuine data and real information and not just anecdotes or sensationalized headlines. Um, and that is, that is where we are. I like to say that some people were happy with what we did in 2019 and unhappy with what we did in 2020. Some people were unhappy with what we did in 2019 and happy with what we did in 2020. Some people don't like any of it. Um, but I, I like to look at everything holistically. This was our first term. Uh, I would compare where we end up December 31st of 2020 to where we were December 31st of 2018 and judge that body of work. I think it was uh, Crystal's group, if I'm not mistaken, Center for Core Innovation that took a look at it and said, even after the first change and the second change, we're still at the point where upwards of 80% of charges that normally would have been bailable are now not eligible for bail. So we have made it, had a profound impact um, on the uh, criminal legal system uh, in New York and in uh, I believe it's for the best. I think you're muted, Amy. Host would like me to unmute. Oh, thank you so much. That was in incredibly um, powerful and you also really set the stage. Can I, let me just ask one follow-up question. In terms of um, the legislation and in terms of journalism, what are stories that come are top of mind for you. If you could reach back and think which ones did good, which ones um, may have misrepresented what was going on. Um, I just was, before we go on, I think that's like an important thing since our audience is journalists here. Like, can you get, do you have, does anything come top of mind for you? If not, okay. Oops, you have to unmute yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're all, we're all falling victim to the same thing. Okay. Um, it's interesting. I mentioned how helpful the New York Post was. They obviously are, you know, they're a tabloid and they love their um, catchy headlines and they, you know, they, they were just as quick to sensationalize some of these cases that didn't have anything to do with the law, but I, I do give them credit for doing the work and, and looking at the numbers um, ultimately. Uh, the New York Times has done some good work on uh, evaluating. Uh, and then, you know, the, the, the issue with a, uh, a complicated uh, uh, issue like the one we're dealing with is that it takes a lot of space and a lot of resources and a lot of commitment 
on the part of all of us, including um, uh, journalists, to dig into it and find out the truth. And we're in an era of uh, economic issues on the on the press side. Obviously, it's not what we're here to talk about today, but um, there's a lot of outlets that maybe don't have the ability to do that. And so I, I, um, it's something we're all struggling with. But you know, the the cases that that are top of mind that you mentioned are generally the ones that. Um, didn't have anything to do with the current law or really highlighted a separate issue, which is uh, mental health uh, um, related problems that so many incarcerated people have. There was the woman in Brooklyn who I think was slapping That's her, what her I think. people, right? Um, the woman in and, Brooklyn who attacked Hasidic Jews. And, then yes. there was, and there was also the Jennifer Gonerman New Yorker piece and the tragedy that happened afterwards, but that really, like, that. I mean, that took a one person story and just made it so real for so many. Yeah. And there was the repeat bank robber I mentioned earlier, but the, the, the issue of people have to really get their heads around and it requires them to get past the first level of, of conversation is what good would it do to take that woman and put her in Rikers after she gets evaluated, she probably will be out on the streets again, regardless. And she would not be receiving the help she would need in the meantime. Um, and so when you're dealing with people who maybe need social services more than they need to be incarcerated, you're actually doing your good, not just for that person, but for all of society, because you're generating repeat problems by not tackling the underlying issue that's driving a lot of it. And one of the problems we had as we were trying to push back against that with success stories is by definition, these people that we're talking about have been charged with crimes. And so there's a success story. Here's someone who's out on bail and is keeping his job and providing for his family, but he doesn't want to talk about it because he's going to be on trial in a couple of months and he's not really looking to put a spotlight on himself. And so we didn't have the ability to counteract uh, uh, the stories that were being written in the papers with the success stories on the other side. And so that's, why the da that's why the data will be so important when we start getting these reports. Right, right. Yeah, the, da the data is important, but it's, it's hard because the news is supposed to be like, what makes today different than every other day and so it's 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 you know the good news stories often don't make it but yes the, I, I think the the data will hopefully ground us in all of that and um that's great and I, i'm gonna at the at, at, just so you know panelists i'm gonna weave back and hopefully at the very i want to continue on with the story but um i'm at the end i want to loop back with all of you and ask what stories weren't told, what stories aren't being told, and what to watch on the future. So that's coming as my next question. But before we go there, um, Insha Rahman, we are so lucky to have you here. Could you please tell us about you and Vera's role and everything that you did um, sort of picking up the ball here? Um, um, and, and, and also, I mean, your organization has a profound amount of data and if you could talk about sort of the landscape and what it means to have this legislation that does mandate, even though it's slightly unfunded mandate, um, yeah, if you could please pick up the story of where he left off. Sure. Um, so I actually began my legal career as a public defender up in the Bronx, um, and I, watch bail get set on people I represented day in and day out. And every single time bail got set, I always wondered, um, did the judge set $500 bail because he thought the person I represented could afford it and intended for the person to be released? Or did the judge intend for my client to remain in, incarcerated pre-trial? And that's the, sort of the, the problem fundamentally with money bail, um, as well as its injustice, it obscures the real intent of the judicial decision. And one thing that we have seen in doing bail reform across this country, and Vera has been around for the past 60 years, our very first project was in 1961 um, on bail reform in Manhattan Criminal Court. And since then we've worked on bail all across the country. Um, one thing that we've realized is that when it comes to judges, they will do the most conservative thing, which each and every time because of the power of the press and media, it's called you know the New York Post effect, at least in, New York City criminal courts. Nobody wants to be on the front page of the paper for having been the judge who released somebody, and that is the, the one outlier case where something bad happened. And so in certainly when I practice as a public defender, we saw this all the time, and you could see judges almost look at you and be like, I'm sorry, and set bail. 
And then when I came to Vera in 2015, the very first project I led was in partnership with the Office of Court Administration. And I said, you know, if we're going to have a bail system, there was no real momentum for bail reform back in 2015. As the senator said, we had a Republican Senate, um, a Democratic Assembly, and there was no likelihood that the bill that he had introduced in 2015 was going anywhere. And so our plan was, what can we do county by county, jurisdiction by jurisdiction, to get judges to actually think about their bail decisions differently? And under New York law since 1971, there have been other forms of bail that are far more affordable for people on the books. And they are called partially secured bonds where you put down no more than 10% of the bail amount to the court. And so long as you come back for all of your court dates, you get that money back. Or even what's called an unsecured bond where there's still a money amount that's set in the case, but you don't have to put anything down up front. And so long as you come back to court, you're not on the hook for any of it. And both of those options are far more affordable for people than the kind of bail that got set day in, day out in New York courts, which is insurance company bail bond, having to go to a private bail bondsman um, to get bailed out. And what we did back in 2015 is we launched a project with the Office of Court Administration to get judges to use partially secured and unsecured bonds. And we had some limited success. We were in two courtrooms in the Bronx and Queens. Um, we have a report coming out on our efforts a little bit later this year. But what we also did was recognize that the use of bail even in New York City looks so different than the use of bail in Buffalo or Albany or anywhere else across the state. And so in my role leading policy on bail here at Vera, I actually traveled around the state and sat in courts and watched what the judges do when they had the option to release somebody or set bail. And over the course of two years, I have sat in over 100 courtrooms across the state um, in 35 of the 57 upstate counties and have just documented and collected like what does bail look like? What does that practice look like in these courtrooms? And it was really our role in working with the Office of Court Administration, really understanding the full scope of the bail statute here in New York and the unsung possibilities, even if we weren't going to eliminate money bail entirely, what else could we do? That was the role that we played in 2017, 2018, then 2019, where we worked very closely with the governor's office as well as with the legislature to help draft the legislation that ultimately passed in 2019. And from our years of working on bail reform, I'd say there's four key objectives when we pass bail. The very first is just to simply make sure that there are far fewer people in jail. We as a country and here in New York State, we've too often conflated public safety with incarceration. And in fact, the two aren't synonymous. Um, incarceration actually harms public safety, doesn't improve it as counterintuitive as that seems. And I can say a little bit more about that in a second. So the first goal is to have fewer people behind bars. The second one is to eliminate or at least greatly reduce the role of money in pretrial release or pretrial incarceration. The second one, or the third one, is to make sure that we're addressing and rectifying the racial disparities that are rampant in how money bail gets used. And the fourth is to make sure that we don't compromise public safety. And so what's the role of data in this? Well, in New York, since bail reform went into effect at the top of 2020, we actually know today, compared to this time last year, there are 43% fewer people behind bars in jail in uh, the state. And that's a remarkable, remarkable number. We literally have almost half as many people in jail in New York State today than we did a year ago as a result of bail reform. And compared to other parts of the country that have passed bail reform, New York's is actually far more reaching in terms of its decarcerative effect, meaning how much it, you know, gets people out of jail. New Jersey that did bail reform in 2017, they've had an overall 31% impact, a drop in their um, jail population. And other places that we've seen enact bail reform, they've actually had no impact, like Kentucky or Maryland. And so one thing that's really distinct about New York's bail reform is that that whole thing about judicial discretion that I started with, I think the most important and powerful thing that New York bail reform did is it eliminated judicial discretion to use incarceration on the low level offenses, on misdemeanors and nonviolent felonies for the most part. And the reason that was so key is I would say actually because of the impact and the power of the media to sway judges to do the more conservative thing. And ideally, we could trust our courts and our criminal legal system to 
do the right thing, which is to release people unless there is a real reason not to. But we know that that historically hasn't been how the courts have worked. And that's why the legislature and the governor stepped in to say, where we know that people can safely walk among us on those low level misdemeanor and nonviolent felony charges, we're actually gonna take out the option of incarceration. We're gonna leave in the option of pretrial supervision, of monitoring, of supports, but we're gonna say incarceration is off the table. And that's the difference between what we did here in New York in terms of legislative reform compared to New Jersey or um, Maryland or any number of other places. Um, and that's a really remarkable thing that we've done. In terms of racial disparities, we've been collecting jail data from across the state and looking to see how bail reform has impacted um, who is incarcerated, especially black and brown New Yorkers. And um, we're still combing through that data, but we're already seeing a huge difference, not only in the drop in jail population, but who remains behind bars. There's so fewer people on misdemeanors and nonviolent felonies now in jail in New York State, that actually means there's far fewer black and brown New Yorkers behind bars. Because what we saw is the greatest and grossest racial disparities in terms of arrests and setting bail were on people who were charged with misdemeanor drug possession or low level larceny. All of the offenses that under the new law, um, judges can't set bail on and people are automatically released. And then third, in terms of making sure that we are using money less. Um, as the Senator said, originally what passed, um, you know, eliminated the use of money bail for about 90% of all offenses, even with some of the rollbacks that got enacted this year. Now upwards of 80% of all offenses and all arrests aren't subject to money bail. And that's a huge decrease in the amount of wealth that's being taken from poor black and brown communities in New York and put in the hands of the bail bondsmen or in the courts. And then finally, here's the piece of data that we can't see that we need to be able to see, which is what is the impact of bail reform on public safety? Um, every single panelist so far has mentioned the New York Post piece because it was just the only piece that we've seen that has actually looked comprehensively at uh, people who've been released because of bail reform. And I'm actually gonna name the, the denominator, which is it's 11,000 cases were in that sample um, that the New York Post looked at. And of those 11,000 people who'd been released because of bail reform from Rikers Island, only one was um, charged with a, a shooting. And those are the kinds of numbers that we can't see in real time that we need to be able to see to accurately and fairly assess what the impact um, of bail reform is. And so back in January of this year, um, Commissioner Shea from the NYPD claimed that bail reform was responsible for an uptick in crime. And we actually did a piece looking at real-time NYPD arrest data to see how true is that? Is there actually an uptick in crime and is it caused by bail reform? And since we don't have good data about that correlation, we couldn't answer that second question, but we certainly could answer the first. And here's what we found is that 17% uptick in crime that Commissioner Shea claimed was as a result of bail reform between uh, January 2019 and January 2020. When you actually go back and look at NYPD data, we found that just between January 2018 and January 2019, there was actually a 43% uptick in murders. Um, between January 2015 and 2016, there was a 25% uptick in felony assaults. This is all the NYPD's data. But without the political backdrop of bail reform and a policy change that law enforcement opposed, there was no highlighting those upticks and also declines in crime. And so the reason I bring that up is for all of you as journalists who took Commissioner Shea's claims that the 17% uptick um, over one month is something that we should be concerned about and it's clearly related to bail reform, look further at that data. Don't just take it at face value. Go back to the source and actually question, is this truly um, a claim that the commissioner should be making or is there more there behind the story? And that is the responsibility of media and journalism, both for the role you play in the courts and the political sway that the media has and then also in the backlash and making sure that the stories that you do tell, that you look to see the numbers, that you check for their accuracy, that you don't just take them at face value. Because really, at least historically in this country and in this state, and we're seeing this sort of really crystal clear with bail reform and the backlash, 
law enforcement has always been taken at face value for what they say. And law enforcement is no less subject than the rest of us to their biases, to their political leanings, to the outcome that they want to see. And so the most important thing that media can do in this moment is first of all, tell the stories that don't get told about the people who benefit from bail reform and actually walk safely among us. And then in the outlier cases, the one shooting of the 11,000 people released actually dig further than just the headline to know the statistics themselves. That was terrific. Thank you so much. Um, would you just take um, a few minutes and just, when, when you talk about look at the data, um, you know, New York data is siloed in many different places. Um, could you give a, a brief overview of what is available? And this is and maybe this is too much to ask of you, but could you give a brief of what is and what um, you hope will be available because of the law? If you could, um, if you could just just explain. Um, because if I'm a journalist, I'm wondering, like, well, where can I find the data, you know, and obviously it would be Vera, but um, besides that. Um, so New York data is even worse than data that we've seen in some other places, like Florida has better data than we do. Um, there's a number of states that do, which is really too bad because it makes being able to track in real time what we do difficult it also means being able to tell good stories about what's happening difficult. And so here's what does exist. New York City actually has remarkably good data, both on um, law enforcement and arrests, as well as um, very good jail data that they release every day. Um, and that's a result of sort of local ordinances and laws that require our local agencies to do a good job of reporting. It's much more checkered across the rest of the state. Um, court data is pretty much non-existent. It's hard to get. It's not published anywhere. And part of the reason for that is New York is somewhat unique in that we have one, you know, sort of court system through the Office of Court Administration. Then we have, if you live across upstate New York, this is familiar to you, town and village courts which don't operate under the same data system, the same databases as the Office of Court Administration Court. So there's a fundamental problem with being able to collect court system data. And Amy, you said when you have been asking for three years for court system data, you got five courts, which were the New York City courts, which have much better data collection than any of the others. And I'm sure there was no way that you would ever get the town and village court data, even if you got upstate court system data from the OCA system. So there's a lot of work to be done and hopefully the legislature and the governor's office at some point when we get out of a pandemic and this recession, think about how to collect data and create a court system that actually allows us to be able to track in real time what they're doing. And I had mentioned New Jersey earlier and that New Jersey passed bail reform in 2017. One thing they did was spent two years actually updating their entire court system and their data collection so that when bail reform was enacted, they could collect and release every single month what exactly was happening with bail reform, with release decisions, detention decisions, in a way that we just simply haven't been able to do here. In terms of um, law enforcement data, so police departments, sheriff's departments, again, across upstate New York, a couple of um, agencies, Buffalo post some data, Albany post some data, but most do not. Um, and again, uh, doing FOIL requests and things like that are the best way to get that data or asking for local legislatures, county legislatures to request that data and turn it over is another way to make it public. And then finally, one thing that we do very well is we do publish um, jail data every month. The Division of Criminal Justice Services releases this data in real time. So that statistic that I just mentioned about a 43% in the overall jail population from this time last year, that's just DCJS data that's publicly available in their open data portal. So those are the three main sort of pieces of data that we want to look at. That's where currently the state of play is with what's available or not. And what I think is most exciting about the, the data collection piece that got passed um, earlier this year is that we will know specifically about racial demographics and impact of um, bail. We will also know more about bail practices themselves and 
release versus um, setting bail versus remand, which we can't tell at all right now, um, except for things like we're doing, which is just foiling data from local jails to find out. Um, but there's no way to foil the court system because they simply don't have that data to give us. Um, so that is one really significant improvement. I would say, and Senator, you've heard me say this before, to be able to have it monthly would be tremendous. But we also know that our system simply aren't built to give us this monthly. And so the best we did was say every six months, and that's still far better than what we have now. Okay, that was super helpful. Thank you so much. Um, Erica Bond, where are you? There you are. Um, okay, Erica, Chief Policy Strategist for the Data Collaborative for Justice at John Jay. Um, your report is fantastic. I've been reading the reports that you and Crystal did um, last night and this morning. Can you please just give us, um, you know, just, just a real lay of the land out of the 2018 baseline and the original reforms, et cetera, you know, and what you were trying to lay out in the beginning and then what happened. Sure, thank you, Amy. Um, I think the piece, the, the sort of thread I can pick up on here is talking a little bit about, more about what data we have available, what we don't have avail available, what is limiting in terms of our ability to understand the impacts, um, and what we've tried to produce so far in order to establish baselines and help journalists like those on this call um, understand, you know, where we're starting and then how important metrics change over time. So over the next three years, the Data Collaborative for Justice is committed to studying and publishing research on the impacts of these recent criminal justice reforms. And I say criminal justice reforms because we have been so focused on bail that I think it often gets lost that there was actually a much broader set of important reforms that um, also went into effect um, on January 1st of this year, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But we really think at my organization that it's essential that we have a data-driven conversation about how these reforms are working and whether they're having their intended effects and whether there's some unintended consequences. And we've been doing this and we're committed to doing it because far too often the public discourse about crime and the criminal legal system is focused on fear and not facts. And we saw that after January 1st with many of these one-off stories. Um, and as the Senator noted, some of them were maybe related to bail, some had you know, no relationship at all. And so we really think data and research is important to counter some of these um, narratives that really are based on the fear that people will commit crimes if they're released pre-trial pre um, and the fear that they might not show up to court. And there are ways that we can actually look at and measure some of those issues. Um, but that will take some time. So, you know, one message I really would like to drive home for our audience here is that we simply cannot understand the full impacts of New York's criminal justice reforms just yet. And there are a number of reasons for this. One, not enough time has passed to really assess these reforms. They were implemented on January 1st. They were amended in April. As you noted, Amy, those amendments didn't even go into effect until July. So we really haven't yet had an opportunity um, for these cases to make their way through the system, for people to have an opportunity to appear or not to appear, right, or to commit new crimes or not. Um, so there really is a, we, we do need a lot more time and data to understand the relationship between reforms and important outcomes like court appearance and recidivism that I think so many of us really care about. Um, the other important um, issue here is, of course, COVID-19. So that hit in March, it radically changed the way people were living their lives, whether they were in the streets, the kinds of crimes that were being enforced, that people were being arrested for, and radically changed the operations of the criminal legal system. And those are obviously going to change many of the metrics that we care about. Um, and so it's going to be very difficult, I think, to actually disentangle the impacts of these reforms from the impacts of COVID-19. Um, and then finally, as I mentioned before, there's a number of different reforms that are going into place. So we love to sort of put everything under the catch-all of bail reform, but there were significant reforms to the use of desk appearance tickets 
which again, I'll talk about a little bit more, to discovery, so the rules that govern um, when, pro when and how prosecutors have to turn information over to defense counsel, and also um, reforms related to case processing and speedy trials. They were all implemented simultaneously. So from a researcher perspective, this is very difficult to disentangle, and I do think it's important for journalists to understand and appreciate that, that bail reform is actually, what's been called bail reform is actually uh, encompasses a much broader set of reforms. I will say with respect to the amendments um, that were made in April, they did not touch DATs, they didn't touch discovery or case processing, so folks should just understand that those pieces remain intact. Um, and I, as the prior panelists noted, as the Senator and Incha noted, um, one important change in the April reforms was the inclusion of much more data reporting requirements on how the criminal legal system is operating across the state. And we think that is great. However, and again, picking up on a theme I think others have raised, it really just captures one dimension of the impacts of bail reform. So into the future, potentially we can look at whether people appear for court, under which conditions, so which kinds of pretrial release conditions actually work to get people back to court and address maybe some of the underlying issues that might have caused them to commit crimes in the first place to the extent that they have, um, and whether they commit new crimes. But it's still going to be very, very difficult to measure the positive impacts of these reforms on individuals, on their families, and their communities. And I would really just urge the press to sort of use this as an opportunity to tell some of those stories. So there's a piece of all of this that requires data and research to understand the impacts of reforms. And there are some things administrative data is, is, is not really well positioned to address. So while we're taking a step forward in terms of collecting data to understand how our criminal legal system is operating, what is uh, not fully addressed is sort of the collection of information about how communities benefit when additional folks are released pre-trial. Um, and again, I think that the, that is a real opportunity for the press to come in and fill those gaps, and the senator spoke to that earlier. So the bottom line is we need more time, we need more research, and we need more data to fully understand the impacts of these reforms. And while we wait for enough time and data to accrue to conduct these more meaningful empirical assessments, we've been putting out a couple of reports really to help set expectations for how these reforms are going to impact New Yorkers. The first report um, focused on an underappreciated aspect of these reforms related to desk appearance tickets. So um, currently under the new law, as of January 1st, uh, police departments are now required to issue desk appearance tickets for most non-felony offenses and most class E felonies. And that means that for a broad swath of crimes, police will no longer be making custodial arrests. And instead, people will receive a ticket that requires them to show up for their first court appearance within 20 days. So previously, in many of these cases, an officer would make an arrest. Someone, someone could be held up to 24 hours. They'd appear in court. And at that point, the bail decision would be made, right? Whereas now, in a much larger set of cases, folks are going to be released with a ticket and asked to return to court within 20 days. Previously, departments had the discretion to issue tickets for these types of crimes. So non-felony offenses, most class E felonies. And in fact, our research showed that the departments and police officers were actually issuing DATs regularly. So this is not a new tool. It's one that's been used in the past. The difference now, and to Incha's point about discretion, but in the policing context, now there is no longer discretion on the part of um, police departments to issue DATs in this broad set of cases. So we looked back at 2018 because we really just wanted to understand how have DATs been working in the past so we can understand moving into the future post-implementation of the reforms, how they changed this practice. And what we found was that in 2018, across the state, 30% of arraignments involved a DAT. And there was actually really substantial regional variation. Um, so in New York City, it was 22% of arraignments. and the New York City suburbs, it was 60% of arraignments. Um, and that kind of goes to show these reforms can have substantially different impacts across the state. And that is something that I think we all need to, to pay attention to in the future. So, so why does this matter? Um, much of the rationale for bail is to get people to show up for court. And the debate about bail reform has focused a lot on whether people who are released without bail will show up to court or whether they'll commit new crimes. But this has really ignored the fact that under the new reforms, the default for most arrests will be a DAT. 
And that means a significant percentage of people will receive a ticket and they will remain at liberty with no conditions attached for several weeks before their first court appearance. Now, this isn't a bad thing per se, but it does complicate our ability to understand and disentangle the impacts of bail reforms um, from DATs on things like court appearance and recidivism. Now, the good news is that what we found when we looked at 2018 data is that the overwhelming majority of DAT recipients statewide, 85% of them, showed up for their first court appearance. Again, significant geographic variation in, in appearance rates. And that, I think, starts to raise some questions about whether additional resources are needed to ensure that people show up to court. Um, and I think, as was alluded to before, there weren't a lot of resources dedicated to assisting localities with implementation of these reforms. And I think it's, that's going to be an even tougher um, sell, given the economic circumstances that we're dealing with now as a state. Um, but I think if we see in the future that court appearance rates are falling in different parts of the state, there is an opportunity to have a conversation about whether we should be dedicating more resources um, to helping people show up. Because I think what we'd hate to see is um, a circumstance where folks say, oh, the reforms failed, when in fact there are things that we can do between rolling them back um, and just letting them stand um, as, as they are. So in the future, we'll continue to look at this. We will establish a baseline for DAT issuance in 2019, um, and we'll look at charges, we'll look at differences by geography, we always look at demographics, um, and, and we'll continue to study this issue of, of DATs moving forward. So that was our first report. The second report focused on estimating how the original set of bail reforms would have impacted rates of release in 2018 cases. And I'll just walk you through some of the findings there. So had the original reforms been in place in 2018, new, and this is for New York City, we weren't able to do this statewide, though we will do this in the future statewide. Um, in New York City courts, had the reforms been, the original reforms been in place in 2018, uh, they would have been required to order some sort of release without bail in roughly 20,000 additional cases. So what actually happened in 2018 was 105,000 cases resulted in release without bail. Had the original reforms been in place, that would have been 125,000 cases. Now, I think an important fact for journalists and the public to understand is that in New York City, we already had pretty high rates of release. So 76% of um, cases resulted in release without bail. Had the reforms been in place, the original reforms been in place in 2018, that would have gone up to about 90%. And there's some borough variation there, and that's something that we take a look at in our reports. And I think someone was going to post them in the chat. So for folks that are interested in looking at those details, that, that's available in the report. Um, and then another, I think, important uh, fact that we included in our report was around the economic, the potential economic impact of these reforms. So what we saw was that for these 20,000 cases in 2018 that would have resulted in release without bail had the reforms been in place, there was $250 million of bail attached to those cases. And so when we think about the impacts on individuals and communities and individuals' families, I think we have to think about the significant dollar amounts that had attached to these cases. Um, so put another way, what actually happened in 2018 was $435 million of bail was set. And with the original set of reforms, that number would have only been 243 million. Now that's still a very large number, right? But it does give you a sense of the kind of economic burdens that bail was imposing on communities um, prior to the reforms and how that might change, um, would have changed with, with the amended reforms. So clearly the amended reforms will impact these numbers. And I think Crystal and CCI have done some great work to look at the amendments and, and Crystal will speak to that when she's talking about her reports. Um, for this audience, I really just wanna preview what they can expect from our organization in the future that might be helpful for their reporting. Um, so we continue, we plan to continue to produce research that will establish baselines for 2018 and for 2019. And obviously once data is available for 2020, we'll be able to make comparisons on a host of metrics from before and after implementation. 
Um, we have an upcoming report that will look at uh, the original and the amended reforms, how they would have impacted 2019 cases. This is similar to what CCI has done, but we're going to look at some specific questions around how they would have impacted various types of charges um, and various groups of people. So looking at race, sex and age. We'll also look at um, borough variation as well. And in the future, we're going to expand our purview to look at outcomes from across the state. So as we have always done in the past, we will look at arrest rates from across the state, which I think will be inf important to informing this conversation about public safety. Um, we'll look at DAT issuances I discussed earlier, bail, pretrial release decisions, case processing times, and we'll look at case dispositions, because ultimately I think there's some interesting questions out around whether increasing rates of pretrial release may change the number of people that are found guilty or plead out, and I think we'll want to understand some of those outcomes. Um, and as with everything, we'll look at charge, geography, and demographics. Um, I also will just pick up on a point that Insha made earlier about these town and village courts, which I think are, um, you know, a very interesting feature of the New York state system and one um, that we've had very little data um, to help us understand how they're functioning for a long time. Um, so just as background for folks, most counties have one or more city or district courts that are located in an incorporated city. But outside the cities, there are these 1,300 town and village courts. They're staffed by roughly 2,000 magistrates, and they have jurisdiction over misdemeanors. And traditionally, they really have not reported into these statewide data rep repositories. So when we were thinking as an organization, how are we going to measure and understand the impacts of reforms, we knew we had to find some alternative approach. And so what we've done is we're partnering with uh, wonderful researcher upstate, Alyssa Warden with the Finn Institute. Um, and she is actually partnering with a set of counties upstate and will be working in those counties to collect baseline data to understand um, important metrics for 2018 and 2019. And then she'll be looking at those counties uh, for post implementation for 2020. So we're really excited about that. And we're hoping to shed some light on how particularly for um, upstate some of these reforms impact um, their local systems as well. Um, so just to sort of uh, end things here, over the next few years, we're going to be doing our level best with the available data to understand, understand the impacts of, of these reforms across the state. But we really do have to acknowledge um, that isolating the impacts of these reforms is going to be very, very difficult for researchers. Given the realities of COVID-19, the economic and social upheaval that has accompanied the pandemic, it's very likely that a host of other factors are going to impact things like crime and whether people show up to court um, and recidivism. And I think it's also important that we really recognize the, the disproportionate impacts that the pandemic is having on communities of color um, that have also historically been most entangled with the criminal legal system. So, so we're very much committed to studying these reforms, um, but we also recognize that a lot of the research that we're going to be producing is actually gonna be measuring a much broader set of issues during a time that will be a very difficult time, I think, for individuals and for their communities. Um, and also, it's just likely that government budgets and programs are going to be under strain and services that might have helped to protect communities from the root causes of crime um, may be undermined during this period. So all of that is really just a caution to journalists um, when they see data from our organizations or from government agencies to be really thoughtful um, about drawing a straight line between bail reforms that went into effect in the beginning of this year um, and, and some of these, you know, potentially negative outcomes because there are a lot more factors that are at, at play here. Um, okay, thank you so much. I'm really excited about the justice court work that you're gonna be doing. And I mean, just to put a face on it, you know, these justice courts, they exist throughout the country, right? There are these, but generally they're in more um, rural places. Like you'll see that in Mississippi, you'll see that there's a lower court judge who's may not be a lawyer, right? And that person, the idea is that that person is like tied to the community and can decide, you know, what a charge is so that it can go to a higher court. But it's, it's, it's amazing that we have that in New York where we do have such a large population of attorneys 
and you know and and where you know so many of these these people that decide misdemeanors and affect so many people in the communities they they aren't attorneys and they are adjudicating over these incredibly important matters so it is that that work on justice court is like to me it's like a, it's like pioneering like it's really like incredibly important and um, it'll be fascinating to see what you find and uh, and and yeah kudos to you on that I, I have one other question which is you know if you could do it again i mean it's it's amazing that you guys got a bill passed right and you worked on that and you did the report you did the baseline work and then all of a sudden, I can't even imagine what it might what it have been like to you. Be like, oh my gosh, there's a movement to roll it back. Like you thought that you had the win, right? And then it's like, oh my gosh, like I'm actually not on solid territory. I'm actually, we've got, there's a, you know, it's, it's somebody's trying to pull it down. Um, if you could do it again, would you have struck, like how would, would you have, would you have done it the same way? Do you think that the first, um, that, that the first bill, you know, was it, was it, was it too radical? We, what we see in this country again and again is just how hard change is, how hard innovation is. Like people, they say that we're the country of innovation, but do we really want innovation in this country? You know, it's like, it just pulls, you, we, we just pull back. I mean, if you could do it again, would you do it the same way or um, would you, would you have structured it differently? So I, I just want to be sort of clear, DCJ was not involved sort of in the development or the advocacy around that bill. And, and I think that's a good thing in the sense that we really are sort of the neutral research organization that is coming after the fact to sort of understand the impacts. I will say the amendments definitely threw a wrench in our research. Um, you know, we thought we'd established the baselines and we sort of understood how to set expectations and, and certainly things changed a bit with the amendments, which is why um, I'm, I'm thrilled that CCI and Crystal have done this great work to help us understand uh, the, the impacts of those amendments. Um, because I do think there was certainly just my observation in the advocacy community, a, a real concern about the amendments and the extent to which they were, they were gonna roll back the reforms. And that's where I think research organizations like ours have a real opportunity to say, okay, let, let's, let's get some data and try to understand like how much the, the ground has really shifted under our feet. Um, and so I think, I think Crystal will have some, some interesting thoughts there on, on the amendments. So I'm gonna pass on to Crystal unless Senator Insha would like to add anything before we move on. Crystal, take it away. We're really excited to hear um, on the impact and, and everything that you've been working on. Sure, thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who has gone before me. You all have laid such a great context and background. And I, I just wanna start by highlighting something that's already been said, which I think is really important to this conversation. When we talk about bail reform and its impact on public safety or its impact on people appearing before court, as I think Insha and Erica both noted, overwhelmingly, this is true for New York City, folks were released, judges deferred to releasing people on their own recognizance in an overwhelming majority of cases. Now, why I think that's important is because what we're now fearing is judges releasing people on their own recognizance or releasing them with what has been added to the statute, non-monetary conditions, and I will talk a little more about that. Um, but what I think is important about this point is that we, I, when it gets reported, I think it should also be noted that ROR has been on the increase for years now. So folks have been having to return to court. And in fact, New York City residents are pretty good at coming back to court overwhelmingly. They show up for all their court appearances, as I think everyone in this panel is aware of. And also, um, even when they don't, which is about 15% of the time, um, they still return within 30 days, right? And oftentimes folks appearing in court or not is a question, not of uh, wanting to abscond, but really a question of other barriers to making that court appearance. Um, now, turning to the amendments more specifically, um, what we sought to do in our report is offer some projections 
um, for what effects the amendments would have. So we, we first did this last year as a response to the initial reform bill passing, and much like Erica identified the whiplash of amendments passing just two months or three months after the first round of, of reform uh, went into effect, what we sought to do was try to inform folks on what we think could uh, happen. Um, and one thing I want to say is that in the, the initial goal, as has been highlighted, of the bail statute was to reduce the number of people in jail. And in fact, the initial rounds of bail reform did exactly that. Uh, exactly that in New York City was to the tune of about 40 percent of the jail population was reduced. And that happened pretty quickly, right? Because we're looking at March 5th, pre-COVID, and I can talk later about why we chose a pre-COVID time point, but prior to the emergency releases that occurred, we already saw a 40% increase rather quickly. Um, another, another thing I wanna say about the amendments before we start talking about the impact of those amendments is that one, it did broaden the category of offenses and folks who are accused and come before the court who could be eligible for bail at the stage of arraignment. It also added to that list of charges that would be bail eligible, um, but it also added, added non-monetary conditions. So to explain and sort of compare data from 2020 going forward to prior years, that's another added challenge and on top of what everyone has already mentioned is that in addition to ROR and bail, now there's this sort of middle ground that has been created by first the initial reform and then added on to with the second reform of these non-monetary conditions that judges can use in their discretion to ensure someone appears before court and to ensure that people are compliant with um, whatever, court, um, whatever court conditions are in place. Um, now, with regard to the impact on the jail, the jail population, and we're talking about specifically the pre-trial jail population. So we were over 5,000 back in April of 2019. Early March of this year, the pre-trial population um, was about 3,014. Now what we anticipate, um, looking at the numbers, looking at the categories of offenses and charges that will now become eligible again in light of the amendment, is that there could be a 16% jail increase of that pre-trial uh, population. And again, that is not relative to where we were prior to any reform passing. That's relative to where we were early March. So, and, and I say that to say that that's, that we, to, kind of to the point that Senator Gianaris made earlier, there still will be a significant jail reduction with the amendments. Um, we do anticipate a 30% jail reduction um, if comparing that to 2019 without any reforms being in place. Um, so some of what we found is that we're looking at judicial practice during 2019, looking at the universe of cases where judges set bail when bail was an option in all matters. Um, looking at those charges and thinking through the, the, the frequency at which they occur in the court, court cases that courts see in New York City courts, um, there's three charges that will likely contribute or will most, will most contribute to, the, to those jail, that jail pre-trial population increase. Um, and that includes burglary in the second degree, in the living area, cr criminal sale of controlled substance in the first degree, and criminal possession of controlled substance in the first degree. Now, there's a lot that we do not know, right? And that we don't currently have an analysis or findings on what exactly has been the crime, the effects on crime and public safety for all the reasons that have already been stated. Uh, we do know that there are cultural changes that are important. A lot of how this is reported on the media, a lot of how this is characterized goes a long way in informing public policy and discussion and the actions of decision makers and what we choose to prioritize um, in dealing with the criminal justice system and as we try to implement reforms. Now, thinking, now, so, so not only is there a question of release as to the con, like how the contents of the actual contents of the law impact release, there's also a question of culture and how folks are making decisions. Um, I would note that there's things that could to lead to further reduction than what we anticipate 
with this bail reform and then its subsequent amendments. One is the effects of COVID-19, right? There's been an emergency response um, that had a great impact on every stage of the criminal court process from arrests to arraignments and every decision point from there forward. And then eventually there were some responses that allowed for folks to be released in, to, in order to mitigate the threat of COVID-19 in jails. Now, this does give us a bit of an opportunity to, to, to study and test what is the fact, what it in fact occurs when folks are not subjected to pretrial detention? What in fact happens when folks are able to serve the remainder of their sentence in the community as opposed to in jail? But in order to analyze that, we need a lot of time. We need a lot of time. We need the opportunity to see what actually happens, uh, what kind of crimes are committed, if they are committed, um, another potential thing that could lead to further reductions is the fact that judges are encouraged to lean on the least restrictive conditions. So where there are, where there's a concern or fear or risk that a person will not re report to court, one important thing is that judges are supposed to be considering what is the thing, what is the condition that will enable this person to return to court. And with that, if, if judges are seriously considering this as in part of their bail and pretrial decision calculation, then maybe we'll see more, more reduction. Um, another thing that can contribute to that, that is largely, I think, an issue of culture that was introduced in the statute is this ability to pay question. Are folks able to make the bail that judges set? Are judges asking how much they can afford? Are judges considering, or, or rather judges should be setting alternative forms of bail um, anytime bail is, is on the table. And if it's set, then there needs to be an alternative form to bail. So, and I raise these things because I think um, the big question on the table is what is the impact on public safety? But I think there are also goals and initiatives within the passing of the statute that I think are also worth asking. Does this statute end up having an impact on wealth-based disparities? Are judges changing their practices such that we're not overtaxing already? We already know that black and brown people and poor people are overrepresented at every stage of the system. Does that continue or does this, um, does this reform do what it intended to do um, in mitigating those racial and ethnic disparities, in mitigating um, those wealth-based disparities. And so as folks are writing and reporting on all the impacts, including the impact on public safety, which will take us time to see, I'm hoping we could also make that part of the public discourse. Are we mitigating, are we bringing like more fairness into the system? Are we creating a system that we wouldn't mind being modeled by other jurisdictions throughout the country. And some of that also goes to a lot of what has been brought up around data, data and data collection and data reporting. Um, this amendment goes a long way in creating a level of transparency and accountability that will allow us to have these honest conversations. It will take time. There's infrastructure that needs to be built um, and there's information that needs to be shared. But it does go a long way in identifying very specific categories, not only requiring that courts and agencies like DCJS collect um, subgroup breakdowns, like who are the people, what is the racial and, and the breakdowns of folks coming through the system, but also what are the outcomes in the court process? Who's being released on their own recognizance? Who's being made to um, follow other non-monetary conditions? Who is, who's bail being set on and are they able to pay? How much pretrial detention are we still relying on? So I guess um, as I think about these issues and I'm happy to, I, I, I'm happy to answer more questions about the report, but I, I just wanna highlight that this is much broader than just the public safety question. And we know as it relates to the public safety question, there's been multitude of studies that speak to the fact that pretrial detention in the long run, unfortunately, increases recidivism, right? That's, the, that's something that we know, and that's, a, those are, that's based on studies that we've seen in multiple jurisdictions, um, including New York City, including Kentucky, and other places of varying, you know, be, from being suburban to rural. This is a common theme that's come, across, come up in many jurisdictions. So I think um, 
The, the other thing that I, I think is important to note is that in the use of detention, um, detention and its connection to public safety or the rates of crime, detention in itself doesn't guarantee safety, doesn't necessarily guarantee that the most dangerous individuals will be isolated from society. What does guarantee is that poor people who cannot pay their bail will be isolated from their communities and the rest of society. Um, so I, I, so I went through that really quickly. If there's any, I'm happy to um, talk about anything specifically as to, as to the report. And thank you. Thanks for the time. Okay. Uh, we have a bunch of questions for you in the Q&A. Um, um, and for, and for um, uh, a lot of the speakers. But so let's start at the top. Um, Senator, um, question from Jennifer, Jennifer Gilroy Ruiz. Um, I had to step away and may have missed this. If so, I apologize. You mentioned that law enforcement did participate in the planning of CJRA. What outreach, if any, was there to victims of crime? and organizations who represent them, for example, Safe Horizon, Sanctuary for Families? Well, a lot of the, um, the meetings were run through our central staff and our criminal, criminal uh, uh, attorneys uh, on the Senate staff. So yes, there was outreach. Um, I know specifically that a number of domestic violence um, victims organizations were involved in the conversations. Uh, I don't have at my fingertips exactly the entire list, but I know there were uh, victims groups represented in the uh, in the discussions. Okay. Um, I, I have a question for you just while we're on you. It was sort of the question that I sort of um, asked Erica, um, but do you, if you could have structured the bill differently, would you have from the very beginning? And is there any kind of a sense that this is, um, that, that, that this is a lesson in terms of how to write the bill? Um, for, for a, is this some sort of, um, you know, for, that well, we should be learning about for, for national? Depends on your worldview, I guess, right? Um, I think, like, you, you've got to look at the sausage-making legislative process as a, yeah. as a fluid and dynamic process. So we had put in a bill in 2015 that was, uh, we tried to make it uh, pure in a sense. It was the advocates were calling it the gold standard bail reform bill for uh, a long time, and then once we got into the um, into the nitty gritty of it, of course, it changed. You got to assemble votes. You got to assemble support. You got to get the governor's signature ultimately. Um, so I'm overall, I'm, I'm very happy with where we ended up. Um, it's very different. The legislature is very different than if one person snaps their fingers and makes things the way they want. So it's never going to be perfect by anyone's measure. But considering where we were, I, I made this point earlier, considering where we were December 31, 2018, and where we are today, it is a sea change. And I would say the most dramatic reform in the country um, on this issue, and I'm proud of it. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's my, my mute here. Um, no, it's, it's, it's truly amazing. We, we find this all the time at our organization that it's often like 10 steps forward to back. Um, because again, like change is hard and we see this in everything, right? I was just listening to this amazing um, thing on uh, the daily yesterday about environmental problems. And even after the fires come and, you know, get rid of a whole community, there's still a sense um, that, you know, we need to rebuild right away, even though there could be other changes that we need to make to prevent the virus from happening. It's very hard not to keep things the same. So the fact that this is come so far since 2018 is, is, it, it is, it is mind blowing. And, and if I may, I'm, I'm very anxious and um, eager to move. I think there's a lot of change that we need in society. And so I'm putting my foot on the gas all the time. And to some degree, we're a victim of our own success. 2019 was a legislative year, like no other in the history of our state. We did uh, a whole panoply of things from, you know, immigrant protections, tenant protections, best climate change law in the country, uh, the bail reform bill, um, codifying Roe v. Wade. I can go on and on and on about all the things we did. And it was almost so uh, successful that everyone just expected us to keep going forward. We have a lot more to do, by the way. 
we haven't done halt. We haven't done the less is more bill. We've got a, a long list of things we can continue doing to fix our criminal legal system. But the blowback that came on this, I don't think people expected because they just thought, all right, we got an all democratic government now. Let's, you know, let's just keep moving forward. But there are elements even within our own party uh, and our own majorities in both houses that are not necessarily as aggressive on this as some of us are. Right. Yeah, of course. Um, I have a data question here in the questions. Um, so Erica, Crystal, and Judd, you know, feel free to jump in. Do you have data on how bail reform has impacted recidivism yet? Do you believe it will impact the recidivism positively? And if so, why? And I mean, just unpacking underneath that, does someone also want to take how to measure recidivism as part of that and why that is um, a difficult thing. I can take the second part because no, we don't have an analysis yet on what the impact on recidivism has been in light of the bail reform statute or the, the reform statute. I, I can begin to explain like where an evaluation should seek to go, right? So there are some elements um, well, we have to start by comparing rearrest rates among specific individuals um, who were released due to the bail reform law, mind you, that passed in 2020 and then was amended um, and then put in effect in July. Um, and then we would need to match that group of people with individuals who were similarly situa situated in terms of criminal history and charges um, and other demographics who were placed in pretrial detention the, the year prior, right? Like closer in time is probably the best way to get a comparison, but that's like the basic place to start. What would be a rigorous evaluation and an honest analysis of did bail reform in fact create crime, right? Create instances of crime and arrest, whereas our old system would not have seen that same um, occurrence of crime. So that's my very basic overview answer where we would begin. Jump in and thanks for kicking us off, Crystal, because this is um, a hard question because there is so much, um, it's really sort of uh, in the eye of the beholder what even recidivism is um, as a first point. And, but let me just say, we do have some baseline data from before bail reform of how do people do when they're released pretrial, either on their own recognizance or released on bail. And New York City has been keeping really good data on this for decades. And what we know, as Crystal said, is um, a little over 85% of people show up to court. And in terms of pretrial rearrest, it's about 18% are rearrested for any offense while they are released and while their case is pending and about 2% are arrested for a new violent felony offense during that pretrial period. One thing I wanna say about that 18%, because I've had people turn and say, well, that's one out of five people, that's not very good. Remember what actually goes into a misdemeanor arrest? Oftentimes it's police initiated conduct, right? Marijuana arrests, um, so often are people minding their own business and the police stop them and arrest them for having a joint in their pocket or not having anything at all, right? Given what we know about sort of manufactured arrests and quotas, especially in a place like New York City. So just actually questioning the premise of this idea of recidivism, because so often arrests in and of itself reflect policing practices and policing mandates rather than any particular conduct of people. I think it's important to always have that lens um, on what we're talking about when we talk about rearrest. Um, and what we also know nationally is that's what the numbers are in places where we have this kind of data. Again, I always point to New Jersey because they do a really good job of data collection on court practices. And um, since bail reform has been in effect now three years there, um, overall crime has dropped pretty significantly. Violent crime has actually dropped very, very significantly um, by a third in, um, since bail reform has been in effect there. And what we've also seen is people still show up to court and that 2% of people who are rearrested while released um, and they're rearrested for violent offenses, that sort of remained consistent across all of the places where we've seen pretrial um, recidivism statistics. Um, one more thing I just wanna say 
right now is, you know, one of the questions was about the uptick in crime that we're seeing this year. And as Senator Junaire said, we're seeing this not just in New York City, but in many cities across the country. But one thing I do want to put in perspective to the extent that data helps us tell an accurate story is that crime overall is down um, in New York, including New York City. It's only if you isolate shootings and homicides that we've seen an uptick. And mind you, it's a significant uptick from last year or the year before, but it's exactly on par with our statistics back in 2015. And again, if you think about where you were in New York City in 2015, did you feel like crime is out of control? Did you feel nervous? No, because without the political backdrop of all of these statistics being sort of, you know, um, blown up in the media, they sort of went like unnoticed. So I just, I think those numbers are really important to put into context where we are now and where that actually puts us in recent history. I think it's extremely helpful to give any kind of misconceptions here that um, that that you want journalists like that was extremely helpful. Are, are there others here that we should be flagging for journalists misconceptions about bail reform or reporting crime things that 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 we want them to ha be have front of mind as um, they leave here and they see stories and they, they, they should know, oh, I don't want to fall into that trap. We've mentioned a few of them and you just did some, but anything else? Yeah, Erica. This may be obvious, but I just want to pick up on a point that Incha made. So while crime is down overall in the city, um, in New York City, and it's really only these just sort of discrete categories of violent crime that are up. I just, I wanna make sure that folks are fully aware that those are crimes for which bail is still a possibility. Um, and I just, I, I just don't think we can say that enough. And I think that's frankly an important distinction between that, what New York did and what, you know, some other jurisdictions have done, but there, you know, we, the, the cutoff was really between violent and nonviolent crime with respect to bail reform. So for the things that, um, are really the focus of the news and the focus, rightly, I think, of many communities across the state. Those where those crimes are up, those are still crimes where the judge has an option to set bail um, and where, where detention is still a possibility. And so I think it's important that journalists understand that because I think a lot gets conflated in this conversation. Can I jump in on that too, Amy? The, the one thing that we spent much of the first couple of months of this year chasing down individual cases and correcting the record. And it's hard to do that because the story gets written first and then you're, you're, you're chasing the facts and getting a correction, which is, you know, one tenth the size two days later. Um, but a lot of times, you know, I would just say be skeptical of the claims being thrown at you by people who are against bail reform. Uh, we had a case where someone was uh, a, a drunk driver and was a repeat drunk driver and had a record of it. And um, uh, unfortunately, I think someone was seriously injured, if not uh, killed in that incident. And the DAs were yelling about bail reform right away. And it turns out once you dig a little further, because of the, the, the gentleman's history, this was a bailable offense. And what happened was one district attorney in one county didn't communicate to the other district attorney in the other county where the incident occurred. Uh, about the fact that this man had an outstanding warrant or whatever it was. And so, um, of course, by the time we figure all that out and get it out to the press, the damage has already been done in terms of public perception. So what happened there was DAs that were more concerned with covering their own asses because they had um, uh, made mistakes in terms of how they were transmitting information amongst themselves, uh, were blaming it all on bail reform. Oftentimes you get judges who are trying to make a point. They'll say, I got to let you out because of bail reform when uh, of uh, the uh, allegation is bailable under the current law. And so I would just encourage um, anyone that's reporting on these, don't take at face value what is being told to you by uh, elements of law enforcement that are just trying to make a point about bail. If you spend a couple hours just digging through it, oftentimes the individual cases have no application to um, bail reform at all. Anyone else before? Yeah, in chat. One more misconception is that money bail gets people to show up to court or protects public safety um, because there's so much hullabaloo about eliminating money bail. And the truth is, we know this from New York City data, which again, we've done a great job collecting and I hope the rest of the state comes up to that level soon. Um, but what we know in New York City is that even without using bail much, as both Erica and Crystal noted from the data, 
people show up to court in the high 80%. Um, and rearrest is actually really low. And these are folks who don't have a bail amount set on them. And compared to people who pay bail and come back to court, that um, court appearance rate is 91% in New York City compared to somewhere between 86, 87% for people who don't have bail set. It's really negligible. And since New York City has um, run citywide a supervised release program, it's a pretrial services um, oversight agency. Uh, what we've seen is that folks who are released under pretrial supervision actually show up 92% of the time. So, you know, pretrial services beats money bail, which is about equivalent to no money bail. So I think that myth that you need a financial stake in your case to show up, it's one that we've dispelled through data. It's one that we've got to dispel in sort of like, you know, the, the public realm as well. That's great. Any other misconceptions about bail reform that we want to get across before we go on to some other questions? Anything else? That was highlighted earlier, but there, you know, in terms of these questions around people being, you know, having a case, getting arrested, being arraigned, being released, and then picking up a new charge um, tends to be the running story or, um, and the reality is that especially in light of these amendments, that's just not the case. Um, you know, the statute does permit judges to use bail where someone has, in the first case, been charged with an A misdemeanor um, and or felony. And then if they're rearrested on an A misdemeanor or felony with that involves harm to a person or pro identify a personal property, that does, once again, even if the underlying charge is one that is intended to be bail ineligible, given the circumstance of having that previous pending case, that does permit the judge to set bail. So this idea that folks can just kind of go about um, picking up cases and bail is never, is, is never an option is just inaccurate. Great. A lot of good misconceptions here. Um, anything else? A tiny gloss to Crystal's point, because that was, sorry, Amy, and then I promised. Oh, good, good. Um, <laughs> But yes, absolutely. Now under the, the rollbacks, um, bail is, um, you can set bail on low level offenses where it's sort of repeat conduct. Um, I think as a field, we need to challenge ourselves for whether bail and pretrial incarceration is the right solution to that kind of conduct. Um, you know, as a public defender, I represented people who would repeatedly get arrested at the same Rite Aid or Walgreens. And as opposed to setting bail, we could actually address the underlying issues that are leading to that behavior in the first place. And that as an investment in public safety is a far better one. And given how expensive jail is, we actually have data on our website about how much it costs across the state in each county jail to hold somebody overnight. Um, it's far, far cheaper to invest in treatment, services, housing than it is to incarcerate them. So that's the gloss on that that I also wanna add. Okay. I have a question that I don't know the answer to at all, but I just to, explain, to frame it for the journalists. So, you know, we're, I work at a data organization and our people um, who clean and code the data spend an enormous amount of time working with prosecutors and in some cases um, clerks who run a court and in some cases, um, public defenders once in a while, but it's usually um, sheriffs and explaining to them why their data entry created so many problems for us. And often, you know, they think they have great data and they don't realize the problem until we put it against a measure. By a measure, I mean like people in jail who are there only because they're poor because they can't pay $500 bail. And so we, you know, we'll go through the data and we'll just be like, wow, you know, we can't get you the diversion measure you wanted because your bail, um, your, your data is entered. So how is New York dealing with the data culture part of this? The fact that people who are not used to entering data, who have to enter data, do we know about that? Do we know about, are there resources for them? And what what is going on right now in terms of, you know, dealing with this thing that I, I've never seen it not 
be a problem. You know, in terms, I've never, I don't have anybody to say, oh, this person has amazing data. Like it's always, um, you know, it, it, everything, I wouldn't say it's always terrible. There's some that are better than others, but everything needs a lot of work. I'll just jump in and make one one quick point here. I mean, I, having having worked with government agencies in the past, I mean, typically because we don't have a long history in this country of actually incentivizing or prioritizing transparency in this particular system, right? In fact, I think we've had a disincentive to really understand what's happening in the criminal legal system. Mm -hmm. the, to the extent data is collected, it's done so for agency purposes and operations only, right? So if I'm a jail, I don't care how much bail was set. What I care about is that you're here, right? So I, I am not as interested in collecting the kinds of measures that might be interesting to the public that might help to inform policy conversations about what it, how it is that you would reduce jail populations. But as a jail administrator, that's never been particularly useful information for me. So that's just like one simple example, but I think the, the root of this problem, just so our audience understands, um, it, it not, it's not always nefarious, I don't think, on the part of agencies. It's just this is a highly siloed system that was never, um, has never been sort of exposed to um, sunshine, right? And so it's only, I think, in more recent years that there has been, there have been organizations like yours and others that really have been focusing on how do we bring all this data together, make sense of it in a way that allow us to, um, develop and implement the kinds of really dramatic reforms um, that the senator and others have worked on in recent years. So, I mean, I, I frankly think part of the culture change is having more attention from legislators and from advocates around data and demanding that information. And that creates kind of this virtuous cycle that I think then pushes agencies to actually start collecting that information because again, I just don't think in the past there's been much of a need for it, right? If you're operating an agency. Right, and just so you know, Eric Bond, um, Lisa Whiteside just wrote in the Q&A that that was an excellent response. <laughs> Anyone else would like to take that one on? Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> no, all right. Um, all right, so, uh, and anyone else before I go on? Okay, to the anonymous ND wants to know, what are the next steps in criminal justice reform in New York State and then also nationally? I guess I can jump in on that, Amy. Uh, I mentioned some of them before. Um, uh, I think HALT has been sitting there for some time that you know, I, I wish we would have already gotten it done, but part of the... Um, problem with the, the uh, bail conversation the last couple of years is it just sucked all the oxygen out of the room on uh, uh, in this space. Uh, and so we were fighting the fight on bail and weren't able to then turn our attention to some of these other things, unfortunately. Uh, but I think HALT is on there. I think Less is More is on there, which is the um, uh, minor parole violations landing people back, uh, back in the system. Uh, I know the the RAP, I'm just using uh, abbreviations and acronyms here, assuming everyone knows what they are, but uh, RAP is the uh, releasing the aging population in prisons. Um, so that's a conversation that we need to have. So there's plenty to, plenty to do still. Um, and I think 2021 should be an interesting year for a lot of that. Incha, I think you're chomping at the bit, but I could be wrong. <laughs> I do think also um, marijuana legalization and drug legalization, it's just been such a long time coming and it's high time. Um, and then as the Senator mentioned, a number of different parole reforms, because as we've cut the jail population in New York to about 10,000 people down from upwards of 20,000, we still have almost 40,000 people in state prison and without parole reform, without sentencing reform, we're not going to get at that. And um, as you said, the, the campaign to release older people in prison, over one out of five people in prison, 22%, are over the age of 55 right now. Um, that's just what an elderly population we have in prison for no real public safety reason. It's because over the years we have continued to incarcerate people on longer and longer sentences. So those feel like the top priorities, certainly for those of us working on criminal legal reform, um, and I know for the legislature as well. And yeah. so you're not saying 55 is elderly, I hope. Never. I'm just saying it's older. <laughs> Whoops. Right. 
Put my foot in my mouth, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, how about how about also because I'm in Rochester and also because a mother of a child, like how about the mental health? Um, you know, on the impact of COVID, I just don't even think we know what it's going to be yet. Like not only in terms of on all on everybody, the people in schools, the kids. Um, and we're seeing, you know, we, we saw this um, in Rochester, there's a, a big mental health outcry, like how are we dealing with people um, who um, during police contact, um, I, I feel like that could be an issue that, um, I, I mean, and also, you know, mental health issues, people are, you know, saying that both presidential candidates have mental health issues. So, you know, I think that could be some sort of an issue that really comes to the, the, the fore in, in the next, um, I, you can feel it bubbling. And it does, Amy, have uh, implications uh, with how we do law enforcement. We had an incident, which is not uncommon, but it was recently here in Queens where so, uh, police were called, as they often are, because someone who has a history of mental health issues was um, acting out. They ended up tasing him and he died. Um, whereas a mental health professional would have been better able to handle the situation. So it's, um, it's a very good point. Yeah. And I do think that, I, I, as I said, I think that there's like a broader mental health issue that's going to be overtaking this country and a topic of conversation in the coming years. And I do think that it almost criminal justice is just a way into that issue you know, it's almost going to be a harbinger of what's going to come in terms of like national reforms in, in that area. I mean, uh, yeah, it's not something that my organization has really done a, a ton of work on, but we're sort of being pulled into it now because we're based here in Rochester and we're thinking about it and we're working on it. But um, it's, uh, it's I, I think it's definitely something that we're going to be it, it, it nationally, um, in addition to everything else you guys named. I mean, what else? What else is going? What else is going on nationally for criminal justice? I mean, gee, it's, it's it, it couldn't be couldn't be hotter right now. Um, so I was going to say, much in the way that we needed bail reform to take away discretion from judges to use bail where they didn't need to. One of the challenges is to enact any kind of policing reform. We have to get at sort of police power and especially the power of the unions. And one thing we've been working across the country with local city councils and county legislatures right now on local policing practices, but each and every time we're seeing state civil service laws sort of hamper the ability to, um, you know, uh, fire police officers who engage in misconduct or even to downsize or right size law enforcement um, agencies so that there's more money that's freed up for say a mental health first responder or a community first responder as opposed to the police. Um, so that's an issue here in New York. We have a civil service law that sort of binds um, the ability to actually negotiate differently with the police unions. And so that's another issue that here and as well as nationally, we'll need to get at before we can actually make meaningful policing reform. Great. All right, um, a question for an anonymous attendee, and then I'm gonna go macro as we, in the last few minutes, I'm gonna go macro and ask some big questions. but. Anonymous ND, would you agree that jail administrators and sheriffs who are responsible for citizens in jails tend to want folks out of their control as quickly as possible due to risks involved with incarceration of those yet not convicted? Amy, I just want to note before you jump into that, that I think I believe Senator uh, Giannaris has to leave at 340. So it is 340 now, so just giving you a time check. Okay, great. Yeah, I'm going to have to jump, baby. Um, anything you need me to answer before I um, head over to my next meeting? Um, just like, okay, yes. You're a journalist and you're thinking about how to cover this. Where should they have their eye on the ball? What do you wish they, that, where should they be looking now um, in, in the next couple of months, which, which should be you know, intense, uh, to say the least, um, to the election after and going to the new year, just the next four to five months, like where should they, where should they, where should they be looking? I mean, I would say um, if they're getting a call from someone in law enforcement, their first 
call of, of their own should be to someone on this panel <laughs> and hear the other side uh, because there is inevitably another side. The, what we saw in the last um, several months was that the um, information and the truth gets thrown in the trash uh, to advance a political agenda. And as you pointed out, the next two months are going to be full. I mean, I think Rudy Giuliani was today in Manhattan talking about bail reform. Um, so, uh, and miss talking about bail reform. Uh, so there's going to be a lot of that. Don't just report what's being said. You know, a lot of the, um, a lot of the lies we're seeing permeating our politics now are also spilling into this issue. And if you want to get it right, you got to hear from the other side. All right. That's excellent. Thank you so much for giving us your time. It was so, so delightful to meet you. Thank you everybody. And, um, congratulations on all the progress you've made. Thank you. Um, um, we've got eight minutes left. Let's just, um, someone want to take the sheriff's question and then the same question for all of you. Like, you've got a captive audience of journalists here. Where should they be looking? But first, what do we say to the sheriffs? What's the deal with jail administration sheriffs who are responsible for citizens in jails? And they tend to want folks out of their control. Is that truly? They want them, they want them out of control quickly or do they want them in there? Um, um, uh, you know, filling the beds because they get paid. Like, what is the deal with sheriffs? What are their incentives and, um, and, and, and the possible risks involved with incarceration of those yet not convicted? Anybody want to take that? Um, so, so I think it's hard for any of us to speak on behalf of sheriffs or jail administrators. So I, I won't attempt to do that, but I, I do have one point to make here. And again, I, having worked in city government, having worked with the New York City Department of Correction and understanding some of the challenges there. And I, and I think this is probably doesn't come as a shock to anybody, but you know, we're asking our jails to solve for a lot of problems we have not solved for in the community. And so I think um, there is often um, frustration on the part of people that run jails that they are being asked to address our most serious deep-seated issues with respect to mental health and with respect to violence in our communities and they simply don't have the time or the resources to actually fully address those problems and for all too long we've thought well we're just going to park people over here and we may or may not give them some services in this context and in this environment that's particularly poorly suited for folks that are in crisis as many folks in jail are um, so I don't think it's really a question of, you know, do I want people here or not? I think for a lot of jail administrators, it is trying to day to day maintain safety in their facilities. And, and historically, many of these facilities were really overcrowded and address fundamental problems that jails are simply not set up to address. Thank well, I have one thing that's very specific to New York, and it's an issue that's really coming up across upstate New York, where counties are struggling with their budgets, and they have jails that are half full right now, um, given the impact of bail reform and releases because of COVID-19. And they have more jail staff than they need, and they also are operating a bigger jail than they need, and they're spending money that they don't need to. And one of the challenges is the county budget, even though it you know pays for the jail. The state doesn't pay for the jail. Counties do. Um, county legislatures aren't being able to downsize the jail or the jail staffing because of a quirk in New York State rules and regulations that comes out of Albany that requires the jail to be staffed to the maximum facility capacity of the jail. So even if the jail only has 200 people but a capacity of 600, then the jail has to maintain staffing for 600 beds as opposed to 200. And so that's been an issue right now. Um, and it's one that I think will be top of mind for the legislature um, in 2021, given the budget crisis and how many counties across the state are really calling for a change to that regulation so that they can in fact downsize commensurate with the drop in the overall jail population. Um, where I think it's going to run into problems are sheriffs who say, well, I don't want my budget cut or I don't want my staff to lose their jobs. Um, so that's where I think the tension sometimes comes up, but that hasn't historically been a tension in New York State because of the particular quirk under state law that keeps the sheriff's budgets and um, departments the same size as they've always been, regardless of what the jail population itself is. Great. Um, Okay, just, you know, we've got only got a few minutes left. Let's just go um, 
Insha and, and Erica um, um, very quickly, can you just give us a sense of where you would where you would tell a journalist they should be looking right now? Like what if you were a journalist, like, you know, what what is what is the story that you would want told? So the stories that I would want told are um, the flip of the, the terrible outlier cases. I would want to see for every bad story about bail reform, about how it's not working, I would want to see an equivalent number of stories about how it is working for families, for communities, for people, for judges, across the board. Um, because unless we have that kind of balance, we're never going to change the dynamic, the, the pressure um, to roll back without sort of a, a fair and balanced reporting. So it's really simple. It's just looking for the stories that historically haven't gotten told, but are actually there a dime a dozen. They're easier to find than the outlier terrible cases because there's just so many more of them. Great. Um, okay, Erica, and then Crystal's got the last word. Um, so I would 100% co-sign on everything Incha just said. I agree. I do think that many of these stories need to be told precisely because, as I said earlier, I don't think the administrative data really speaks to the experiences of individuals um, and their communities and how they um, are relieved of certain burdens when they don't have to come up with bail money and they're present and they can keep their jobs. Um, I think it, it's, it's hard to calculate um, what those impacts are through data, but I think that that is a place where storytelling is incredibly important. And there were panelists on the prior panel who I thought spoke very powerfully um, to the ways in which bail really detrimentally impacted them for their entire lives. Um, so, you know, tearing apart families. And so I think those are really important stories to tell. The other thing that I, we haven't spent as much time talking about and, and does relate to data is around racial disparities. Um, so we've talked a lot about the potential impacts of bail reform on um, recidivism and on court appearance, but one of the in, you know, stated goals on the part of legislators in implementing these reforms was to address disparities. And one of the things that we've seen consistently and my organization has documented is that even as New York State and New York City have implemented um, you know, very far reaching reforms that have really shrunk the criminal legal system overall, these disparities remain a very persistent feature of this system. And so I would really invite journalists to interrogate that and to help understand, to help the public understand the limitations of criminal justice reform potentially in actually addressing those disparities and to start talking a little bit more about why we see disparities in which communities are having um, more touches with the criminal legal system. So even as those numbers go down, we're still seeing, you know, black to white arrest ratios are high and potentially growing for some groups. And so I think those are important questions to be asking and looking beyond uh, criminal legal system reforms to solve for. So I would love to see more stories that really focus on that as an issue and address it in a, in a more sophisticated way. Because I think it doesn't come as a surprise to folks that we have these disparities, but I do think there's an important conversation we need to have about whether these many of these reforms are addressing that specific metric as opposed to just reducing the number of contacts. Thanks, Amy. Thank you. Yeah, I guess I, I would co-sign everything that Insha and Erica has just said, and just to highlight another, another factor of this racial and ethnic disparities question, I think this is a problem that has seen in New York City, New York State, and across the country as well, that where reforms and changes are made, oftentimes what, what occurs after is that those disparities are only exacerbated. And I think in the reporting on these issues, it's worth questioning, what is our criminal justice system about then? If it's about public safety, um, what, why are we seeing this is, that these disparities persist? What are the, there's a ton of decision points that may result in someone being in the jail population, whether that be pretrial or sentenced after a conviction. But what are the, what is the climate? What are the societal circumstances that are contributing to these individuals having police interaction? Um, is it police practices? Is it uh, charging decisions? Um, there's just so much more complexity to this story than just 
um, the numbers or the decrease or increase in the jail population. Amy, you're on mute. Um, thank you guys. Thank you, Erica, Crystal, and Incha. That was incredibly um, illuminating for me. I'm so glad I had this opportunity to learn from all of you. And um, I'm sure that your phone will be ringing off the hook soon with many journalists wanting to do stories and calling you and getting data. So good luck with that. I want to echo those thanks. Um, Erica, Crystal, and Incha, you really created a fantastic an absorbing conversation, especially thanks to you, Amy, for for uh, bringing it all together. Um, uh, we could only, obviously, this is so absorbing, but we could only touch just the surface uh, in just one afternoon of, of conversation. And in fact, um, next week we'll go back at it and really take a closer look at uh, the impact of um, the bail reform and bail changes on criminal justice in New York and the nation. Um, just a few closing notes uh, to those who are still on. Um, uh, we have been recording uh, this conversation and the recordings will be available in the cloud. If you have registered, I will send you the link when it's available. Otherwise, uh, we'll post it on the crime report in our conference page. Uh, you can also send me a note via email. Um, Michael will shortly put on my address, my email address, you can send it to me. And when you send it, please be sure to give your comments about what you thought, what we could be better um, uh, with the webinar, and we will take into account uh, for our, uh, our final webinar uh, next week. Um, I will ask those of you who are on today and still on to re-register for the next one so we can keep track. Um, and as I say, uh, please feel free to comment um, and let us know what you think and suggest any ideas um, that you might have for uh, redoing it. I'll turn it over to uh, Maurice as well for any final thoughts. Um, but in the meantime, thank you for staying with us. This has been, as I said, an absorbing conversation. And certainly there's a lot more to talk about. Uh, Maurice? I just want to thank everyone um, for their participation and for all their um, sharing their knowledge and, and, and skills with us. It's just been marvelous. And uh, I can't express enough gratitude.